Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is gonna be a long one, I'll warn you in advance. If you wanna go and grab a cup of tea, a drink of any kind, if you wanna snuggle up in a blanket, get some food, whatever it is that you wanna do, because today we're talking about the pros and cons of social media witchcraft. <laughs> Recently I was told about the Occulti Tag. This is a tag that was created by Ella Havison, the Red-Headed Witch and Polish Folk Witch, and I will leave all of their content linked down in the description box. The idea behind this tag is to open up about the magical community, especially online, and all of the good bits and the bad bits that maybe don't get spoken about as much. Is the community as useful online as it is in person? Does it hold the same weight? Does commercialization in witchcraft play a negative impact in the community as a whole? These are all topics that are included in this tag. And if you would like to add your own input into this tag so that we can have more information and more understanding from people within the community, you can do that as well. I will leave all the information down in the description box if, if you want to make a video just like this, no matter the size of your channel, just to add more into the conversation as a whole. So with that being said, everything will be linked in the description box. And let's start. This is gonna be really long. I just know it is because I talk so darn much, even about the smallest of topics. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know me, perhaps you're new to my channel, my name is Hearth. That is not my real name, that is my taken name within the witchcraft community, because my practice largely surrounds the home and hearth. I'm a hearth witch, and therefore I go by hearth witch. My content mostly surrounds witchcraft, its practice, and developing your own magical style and tradition, and it's something I've always been incredibly passionate about. I've been here on YouTube since early 2018, posting almost every week, unless I've had a particularly bad time, but that isn't where my witchcraft social media journey began, or my online witchcraft began anyway. I originally started off on forums like Spells of Magic, and I spent a lot of time on there in kind of the early to mid 2000s peak, when forums were really the place to be when it came to witchcraft. I remember Spells of Magic especially being full of hundreds, thousands of members every minute of every day. Communication was flowing constantly, and it's where I first started to learn about other people's magical practice beyond just books. This is where I started talking to other practitioners, learning and growing alongside them, making friends within the community, and eventually this led me onto other forms of witchcraft social media, including Tumblr. Tumblr is really where I started to grow my own social media presence. I was posting a lot of tips and tricks for my own magical practice. When I started my business in 2015, I ended up using social media for witchcraft even more. I started going on Facebook groups, as well as joining Instagram for the witchcraft and witchy aspect of it. And then we end up here today, where my job is part of the online witchcraft community. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this tag so much, because I thought it was really interesting to learn about other people's experiences and their opinions, because depending on where you are in the world, depending on the sites that you're using, the groups that you're a part of, I think it's really going to change your experience of the community, as well as whether or not you were brought up practicing witchcraft with the online world existing existing, or whether you weren't, and in which case I think your opinions are going to be very, very different. So I'm looking forward to watching way more of these tags. At this point in time, I haven't watched any, because I didn't want any of my opinions to be swayed, but once I finish filming this video, I want to find so many of these and watch them all to get other people's opinions, because I really want to know how other people think. I think that's just really cool. So this tag is broken up into several parts. I have them up on my computer here. So we have topic one, which is the impact on the community. Topic two, which is influencer authenticity. Topic three, which is imposter syndrome and FOMO. Topic four is capitalizing off the community. And then we have a little section at the end for conclusions. So I will leave timestamps if you do just want to skip to different points, because I know that this is going to be intense. I'll be lucky if I can get this to be an hour. It's probably going to be more. <laughs> So we're going to start on topic one. Obviously, it would be strange for me to start on topic two, three or four. And this one is all about the impact on the community. So why did I start sharing my practice online? What was my reasoning for it? Did I want community? Did I want to learn? Did I want to teach? The answer is kind of all of the above, <laughs> or at least it turned into all of the above. So originally, as I mentioned, I was on Spells of Magic. This is a really famous forum. Many of you will likely remember using it yourselves. And this was because I wanted to find other practitioners to talk to and learn from. 
I lived in an area that wasn't particularly witchy, and I also didn't feel comfortable reaching out to other practitioners. I was really new in my practice, I had no idea how to connect with other people, and so forums were a really easy way to do that. So I ended up on the forums, and they had a forum section where you could ask questions and have people answer them, and then they have a chat section where you could talk to other practitioners. And during this point in time, Spells of Magic was huge. There were hundreds, thousands of members on every minute of every day. It was incredible. And I ended up making quite a lot of friends on there that really developed my magical practice further, people that I could learn from, older members of the community, as well as learning from the information and the book recommendations that people would post. I would then go and see if I could find them in my local libraries, or I would look up any information about where I could get them from online. And for me, it was a really good springboard of getting into the community and learning from more than just books. Because at this point in my magical practice, I was working intuitively and with the few books that I could find from the library. There was a bookstore that did have a really, really tiny occult section in it. And so sometimes I would get little books from there when I could afford it. But generally I was on my own. And so I started on social media for that reason. But then as I spent more and more time on the forums, I noticed that the same questions would be asked again and again and again. And these were often topics that confused people, energy work, really basic foundational practices that were being skipped over because spell books were really, really popular. The late 90s, early 2000s was spell book mania, basically. And I found that a lot of people that were coming onto the forums actually didn't have any experience at all. They might have been really desperate for something and they were reaching to witchcraft as a last ditch attempt essentially, or they were coming into it having seen something like the craft or practical magic or having found a spell book and they were wondering how to get the things inside to work the way they wanted it to and they didn't know anything about kind of these foundational topics that I had both kind of intuitively picked up on through pure trial and error, as well as having been taught by older members of the community. And so anyone who sent me a message, I would attempt to help them as best as I could. And I ended up with kind of copy and paste responses because I was being asked these questions so, so often. And so I began answering questions in forums. I began answering questions in the chat, answering questions in private messages on the forums. And then it kind of expanded from there. So I started because I wanted the community and people to learn alongside. And it ended up being that I would spend so much time online that I thought to myself, well, why can't I do this in another format? If I could link people to something else, then it saves me having to type out all the messages all the time. Cause it's not like I didn't want to type them out. It's just when you're answering the same question again and again, that can become kind of tedious when you're doing it every single day. So then I ended up moving on to Tumblr where I started writing up posts on topics that I would be asked about a lot so that I could then link people to that instead of having to type it up. And then I kind of started building a following on Tumblr over the course of several years. And then from that point onwards, we've ended up kind of here. So I didn't really go into it with any expectations of teaching or sharing information. It's just that's kind of how it ended up, kind of a snowball effect, essentially. So how has social media as a whole impacted the witchcraft community? Some of you might be shocked when I say that I think it's actually done so much good. I know that I often say that I don't like short form content and I'm sure we'll get onto that in a bit, but as a whole, I think it has opened up the world of witchcraft to people that maybe would never have had an opportunity to experience it. When I first started, I felt so alone. I felt so isolated. That day that I found that book in the library all about Wicca was a really mind blowing experience for me because I truly felt in entirely alone. And then when I found Spells of Magic and I found websites like Witchvox, which sadly is no longer around anymore, they really opened my eyes to the fact that there are groups out there, there are people who practice this with other people, there are people who teach this, there are people who do outdoor rituals and gatherings and you can attend them, you can go and join covens, and that really opened up the world for me. It didn't help the fact that I still felt quite isolated, but it helped in knowing that there were other people out there who were practicing what I was practicing, maybe just in a slightly different way. 
But then when social media witchcraft started getting more and more intense and, and much bigger, especially on Tumblr, I found it massively opened my eyes to things that I had never understood or experienced before. And I was finding people reaching out to me who had no idea that this was something that they could even learn about, let alone practice. And I think it has had that positive impact of the world is a lot smaller than it used to be. And yes, that has pros and cons in a lot of ways, but when it comes to the sharing of witchcraft, I think it definitely opens us up to learning from other sources, from different people in a way that we couldn't before. I mean, I remember thinking, because all of my books were printed in like the 80s and 90s that I managed to get hold of from libraries, on the back it would say that you could email the author or you could send a letter to the author. I thought that was the only way of learning more about witchcraft, was from books and was from emailing or contacting the authors involved. But then all of a sudden I realize that there are so many people out there who have such diverse practices that are willing to share information with you and the easiest way to do that was on social media. So more nitty gritty now, how do I think specific platforms like TikTok, Instagram and YouTube have impacted the magical community? So this is where my opinions diverge based off whether we are talking short form content, post content or long form content. So we're going to be talking about the short form first and this is where I'm not so favorable of it. As I often say on my channel, witchcraft is a craft. It is not simplistic, it is not one dimensional, and it is highly nuanced. And I truly believe that nuance is lost when you try to put a lot of information in a really short time frame. I think it has an amazing reach and it brought so many more people into the witchcraft community that we have never seen before and that maybe would have never thought about the community if they hadn't have found witch talk or witchcraft TikTok. And I think that that is powerful and I think that is really amazing amazing that so many people found it and stuck around, but I have found there to be a lot of harm that's come out of it because you're essentially taking what is a very complex, nuanced topic and you are trying to make it bite-sized, easily digestible, easily consumable. It's often very watered down to make it appealable by the masses. And it is then reduced down into 15, 30, 60 seconds, one minute, 30. This is really not enough time to be sharing the additional nuance that is needed. Now, of course, there are so many topics that can be discussed in this way. If we're talking about the color of candles, if we're talking about a little technique that you are doing that you've got in your own practice, if we're talking about maybe a breakdown of a spell jar or something, I think that is perfectly fine. But the problem comes when you are trying to learn and you're trying to teach all of witchcraft through short form content, because I don't think there's a way of expressing the nuance, the significance. I don't think you can do that in such a short time frame. And we do have the problem of attention spans are getting shorter. People want instant results, instant information. They want to know everything straight away. They want to be spoon fed is what I have personally experienced. And I've noticed this stance of why are you taking so long? Give me the information now. I want it right this second. Stop talking. Give me what I want. I'm going to stop watching you if you don't start talking about exactly what I want you to talk about in the first five seconds. That kind of stance when it comes to learning anything is going to set you up for failure because learning anything is not quick. It certainly is an instant. To do something well is going to take time. To learn something efficiently is going to take time. It isn't something that is an instantaneous fix. And that is something that I think is really negatively impacting the witchcraft community. Gone are the days of learning for a year and a day. Gone are the days of being with a coven for a set amount of time before you're formally initiated. Gone are the days of spending weeks, months, years practicing your foundations before you start doing spells and rituals. Now it's, I learned this morning that I can do this spell and I did it this afternoon, why isn't it working yet? It's that kind of short attention span that I think is probably going to negatively impact the community more than anything else. The unwillingness to learn, the wanting it to all just be handed to you, when really the learning the why, why is rose used in love spells? Why is orange associated with creativity? Why is the full moon used for this? Why, why, why? That aspect of learning is the most important bit 
I can tell you that rose is used for love and that orange is used for creativity and confidence. I can tell you that the full moon is used for manifesting things to completion, but that is just empty information. If you don't know the reasoning behind it, you are simply learning parrot fashion. And I don't necessarily think that that is the best way to build a strong, stable, long-term magical practice. And obviously everything in this video is only my opinion, but I do think that that is gonna have a knock-on effect. When it comes to long-form content and even post-based content, I think this can be really, really useful. I learned a lot when I joined YouTube and started watching witchcraft content. I found a lot of people that were really knowledgeable on their subjects that I would never have known anything about if I hadn't have started looking at YouTube videos. You can learn information that maybe someone wouldn't have included in a book. It's much more personal, it's often very tailored and unique to them, and so you get to feel and see the nuances of an individual practice. For me anyway, it broadened my horizons a lot. There were techniques and styles that I'd used from the very start of my practice that I ended up changing and adapting as I found a technique I didn't even know was an option that allowed me to improve my magical practice further. It was a very different style to reading books, which is what I had previously always done, and it allowed me to gain information that I probably would never have found otherwise. It's also long enough to have additional nuance, extra information can be added into it. You have the option of being linked to further content in a way that's really easy to do. The same applies to text-based content, whether these are Instagram posts with really long descriptions, or whether these are posts like forum posts or blog posts. You get additional context, you get the nuance, it's often longer to read, it takes you longer to process, and you can add additional information information in there in the form of links, link to books, recommendations of books, recommendations of videos. There's a lot more in there that I think makes it really, really useful. So it's not that all YouTube videos are good and all TikTok videos are bad. Nuance and palatability are really important in this. I think if you water something down to make it palatable to the masses to make a video go viral, then that is a problem regardless of which platform you are on. And if you are posting content where all of the nuance is lost, I think that is equally as bad, whether it is on TikTok and Instagram or whether that's on YouTube. I think that's the main distinction. It's just that I often see it going one way rather than the other. That was very long-winded. I told you that this was gonna be a long video. I pre-warned you. <laughs> you cannot judge, I pre-warned. And then the last question in topic one is, do you think that consuming content is becoming a substitute for actual practice? I think for some people, yes. But as with everything, nuance is really, really important. I think that there are a lot of people out there who like the idea of witchcraft and they like consuming the content, they like wearing a particular style, they like referring to themselves as a practitioner, but they are very cautious or they don't want to actively participate in the practice as a whole, and so they live their practice through social media. And that can be caused by many different things. That can be caused by fear, whether that is a fear of spirits, fear of something going wrong, fear of not knowing what you're doing. It can be a lack of confidence in yourself, in your abilities. There are lots of reasons why that might be the case, including a lack of ability in terms of having the energy to be able to do it, having the mobility to be able to do it. For many people, having simply the spoons to be able to do it is not always there. And so they live their practice through the content that they consume. I think that the term armchair magician gets thrown around a little bit too much. It's very derogatory in nature. Oh, you read a lot of witchcraft books, but you don't actually practice. And I think that can often fuel the idea that you are not good enough, that you are not a real practitioner, that you shouldn't be a part of the community, and it, it's never that simple. I don't practice very often. I'm honest about that, because I will only actively practice when I've got something I need to practice for. I won't do spells every single day, every single week, every single month if I am doing them for no reason. When I work with my spirits, when I work with my deities, I do it because I need to. And so for me, I am not a person who's gonna be doing spells every day, every week, every month. I do them as and when it's required or when it's requested on me by a friend, a family member, whatever it might be. So many people would look at my practice, say 
two months ago and call me an armchair magician because I read a lot of books but I don't do a lot of practice. That is ignoring the fact, however, that I have been practicing for 17 years and that in itself, the fact that I am dedicated to this practice, it is part of who I am, it is an integral part of my life and I practice when I need to, that fundamentally makes me a witch or a magical practitioner, however you would want to describe me as. And so I think terms like that being thrown around, especially I've been seeing it thrown around a lot online, I find really ironic because for a lot of people who've been practicing for an extended period of time, their practice is mostly learning, working with their spirits, working with their servitors, doing things as they need to. It's only really in the first few years of someone's practice where you see them do a lot of workings, you know, what spell can I do today? I'm kind of bored, I wanna do something, I wanna practice, you know, give me something to do. That kind of puppy energy, and that's not being said in a bad way, that's being said in a really good way, that really excitable, like, really invested in something that you love kind of energy, that doesn't last forever, and to expect someone to be retaining that for a long period of time I don't think is necessarily fair. I've gotten a little off tangent there, but the only time this is ever really a problem for me is if someone is teaching someone else, or if they are profiting off the community whilst claiming they are practicing it themselves, but they are not. If you are doing this as an individual, that is your personal choice and it's quite likely you have many reasons to do it. But it can lead to knock-on effects if you are doing this as part of a business, if you are teaching other people, especially beginners who don't have any additional information, you can lead to an almost echo chamber effect happening. If one person takes information from someone else and gives it to another, they pass it on to another and another and another, the whys, the whens, the hows all get lost. People aren't actively doing that work themselves so they have no personal experience to add into it and often the information gets changed and warped over time. You end up with things changing on social media in a way that they wouldn't have changed in in-person groups and communities and this is especially harmful if people are paying for your services or you are being the sole teacher of a particular individual. It can lead to a lot of issues that are going to have to be sorted out later on. This is why people have a great pushback to AI books as well because you have a lot of people out there now who are claiming to practice witchcraft, they are actually using AI systems to take information from books that have actually been published by practitioners, content that has actually been made by them, and then pumping out a book that they can make money off of. It's a real problem, but only if someone is doing it solely for the purpose of gaining financial benefit, or potentially putting other people at risk by not having the information themselves. So topic two is all about influencer authenticity. How much of the content on my channel is staged versus being real? So I really try to make sure that everything I'm talking about is something that I'm really interested in at that given moment. Whether it's a style of practice that I'm currently focusing on or something that I really want to deep dive into further because I feel it's a topic that isn't spoken about enough, I tend to chop and change between things and that's why I will go from a video on the elements to being a video about a particular movie that I've watched or a video about making a scrying mirror, for instance. My channel is typically kind of varied because that's how my practice is at any given moment. So I really only try to make videos that I am really interested in and the topics of which I've had experiences in. And so I can bring those personal experiences into what I'm sharing because I do think that those little personal nuances can be incredibly useful. They can take what you would maybe find in a book and then make it a little bit more personal and tailored to you. What I will say though is that sometimes things are grouped together in a way to make it suitable for a video. So for my SAB videos for instance, the workings that I'm doing, I will group them together into one day for the purpose of the video. But in my real practice, I probably wouldn't do them all over the course of one day. Which is why in my Witchy Week video, I was very open about saying that, that these are workings I've done over the course of seven days, but those seven days may not be consecutive. Because often for the purpose of filming a video, I need to do them in quick succession to keep the continuity, 
and to make it a lot easier for me to be editing and processing that video. All of the workings that I do, however, are workings that come from my personal books of shadows. They are workings that I carry out in my own practice. Not all of them will be actively energized during that video. So for the Sabbath videos, they typically are because I will film them in advance so that I can give them time to manifest before that video. But my dedicated spell videos, such as the Rowan Charm video, those workings are not always energized as I'm filming because as much as I would like to say that everyone is nice and kind, that isn't always the case. And if you have an active working being shown on camera and it is still in process when that video goes up, it can be tampered with. So I do always find it really funny. In some of those videos, I will get comments of people saying, oh, the energy in this working is really evil. I'm like, what energy? <laughs> There, there is an energy in that particular working because I was running through the steps so that if you wanted to learn how to do it, you could do it for yourself. But there are many videos that I've done, such as the Witchy Week video, where that is active practice and I filmed it long enough in advance that it's manifested before I even post the video and that way I don't feel uncomfortable about it. So that's really where I draw the line with it. It is simply a case of sometimes it is not suitable to share something that is being actively done and so I will run through the motions of it without actively putting the energy into it just to protect my practice a little bit in that regard. Otherwise, what you see is what you get and it's why the live streams, sometimes my answers to questions will change over time and that is usually because I've learned more information or I've developed my practice a little bit or something has shifted and changed because everything I share, I try as best as I can to be as authentic to my practice as I can be while still making it a watchable, if sometimes slightly long, video. The next question is one where the answer might frustrate a lot of people, and that is, do you think there's an element of censorship in online spaces? Yes, a thousand percent yes, and that is for a few different reasons some of which is about self-preservation and some of which is about the social space as a whole. So let's start with social media as a whole. A lot of the times social media has restrictions on the particular topics that will be promoted and accepted as part of that platform. Some topics are considered sensitive, such as sex, blood, these kind of things. And if you were to post content about such topics, your content could be flagged and then this may negatively impact the rest of your potentially career on social media. If we're talking YouTube, this could result in your channel being removed entirely. And so while this is a worst case scenario, it is something that we need to be cautious of especially if you want to share information and have it reach people, any topic that is deemed as being sensitive is often not promoted and not shared, and therefore your channel is negatively impacted as a result of it. You can often get TikTok, Facebook, or Instagram accounts removed by posting of such topics, and so it does make it difficult because even though you're not talking of these topics in a negative light or in a dangerous light, it is something that is flagged regardless. So you often find that sensitive topics that lean on that side of the spectrum are often not discussed for that reason. The other side of this is that certain topics are quite polarizing within the community. Love spells, curses, working with demons, hell, even working with the Fae. A lot of people have very strong opinions and they are more likely to say those opinions and do worse when they are hiding behind a keyboard and a username. Too often have I heard of people and their families be threatened because of an opinion that they have made on a particular magical topic on Facebook or on YouTube or on Instagram. Because when you mention the word curse or love spell in some of these groups, you are going to be bombarded with people who are verbally abusing you because of it. And it's the reason why a lot of the time I don't talk about these topics because people are very often quick to react and slow to listen. The communication isn't actually there. They think it's bad, they're determined that you are wrong and they're gonna tell you such in the most disgusting way possible. And honestly, I wanna save my peace. <laughs> when you're online, you already deal with so many horrible people on a daily basis, so many lovely people as well, which make it worthwhile by a thousandfold. But when you're already dealing with that on just bare basic topics, I will even get it sometimes on just the coloring of my videos or the way I look or a certain way that I've said a word. And I haven't even mentioned demons yet. So there are just certain topics where we don't talk about it 
because it's just more peaceful not to, and that sucks. <laughs> like, I'm gonna be really honest about it. I would love to be able to talk about these topics. I would love to be able to have an open conversation where we're listening to each other, we're having this kind of balance. But so often what happens is you say something that someone else doesn't agree with and they will immediately cut you off at the knees and they will completely disregard any chance of a conversation, a discussion, and they will just go in. And that's not helpful for anyone, which is why in-person groups are often better for discussing these things because everyone there involved is often more willing to have an open conversation and you can't get away with saying some of the horrible things that get said if people know who you are, they know what you look like, they know your name. It's different than in an online space. And then this leads into kind of a sub question, which is how do I decipher what is appropriate to share online versus what to keep private? Is it based on social media etiquette or personal experience? Sorry, I had to look that way because that's where <laughs> that's where my laptop is sitting with all the questions on it. So for me, what I choose to share varies depending on what I'm working with, who I'm working with. There are certain aspects of my practice that I keep entirely secret. So there are workings that are being undertaken that I have been sworn to not say anything about. I can't even write about them in my own diary. I have been told, zip, do not say anything. There are certain altars that I do not show because I have been requested by the particular deities not to. There are particular spirits that I work with that I will not discuss my active in and out working with them because I have been sworn to secrecy in that regard. These are topics that I simply will not talk about. Active workings, even when I am not being sworn to be secretive about them, I will usually not discuss them until long after they have manifested because I don't want anything to be tampered with or altered, that is a big one for me. And then there are certain aspects of my practice that I won't talk about because of everything we've just mentioned. The fact that there are things that people will misconstrue, there are things that people don't wanna hear there's a certain level of sugarcoating that goes on in the online communities. And I think that is very much more about self-preservation than anything else. It is often about keeping ourselves safe and secure, but there are aspects and styles of practice, like different techniques for tag locks and such, that I typically do not actively speak about online because it is not something I really want to be going down that rabbit hole into when you don't know how people are going to respond to it. Witchcraft is not, you know, beautiful and pretty and pink and sparkly and cute and adorable and suitable for every single scenario and every single conversation. And I think that often gets lost. I practice a form of adapted folk magic. Some people would consider it a style of traditional witchcraft. And with that, there are things that are done and worked with and connected with that some aspects of the community don't work with themselves and actively dislike and will actively go out of their way to tell you that they dislike it. And in which case, I mean, it's my personal practice. However someone else wants to practice is entirely on them. For me, there are some things that I do keep more to myself simply because I don't want to have to have that conversation. I don't want to be explaining every single thing that I'm doing to try to make it more palatable when it actually comes from a much older work that you can then draw in in your magical practice if you feel comfortable doing such. Now, the next question is one that kind of confused me to start off with because I'd never heard the term before, but it says, have you ever encountered grifters in the community? And if you have, how would you recognize them? Now, for me, a grifter is someone who is putting a con on. They are lying about something in order to make a profit. It's kind of like a scam in a way. It's someone who is being deceptive in order to achieve financial gain. And this is something I did speak briefly on earlier in, in this is a real problem when you've got people in the community who are lying about their experiences in order to benefit themselves, whether that is financially, whether that is through influence, following, whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I've experienced them personally. So earlier I mentioned about that particular individual who was contacting members of the community with experience, asking them questions, and then copying and pasting the answers into their own posts, claiming it to be their own words and experiences. If I didn't speak about that earlier, 
That is something I've had happen to me on several occasions. I have had entire videos taken off my channel and reposted on someone else's channel, claiming it to be their own. I have had lots of things like that happen, and usually it's as a way of gaining, usually in backing supporters, influence, followers, likes, these kind of things. This is something I've also seen in person shows and events, and it is jarring when you see it. An example of this would be this one show I did many, many years ago where a lady came up to a stall and asked about a 101 tarot book. She purchased the book and then she went to several different stalls, including my own, asking what I thought of a particular tarot reading, what I thought the reading meant. I assumed that she was a customer, just walking around, checking things out, asking questions to people who've maybe been reading for longer and getting insight off other people. Later that day, I am walking around and I see the same woman sitting behind a reader's table with a book that she just purchased next to her doing paid readings for customers. She had never read for anyone before that point and she was offering paid for readings. That one was really jarring to me. I'm not sure if you would necessarily consider that grifting or whether that was just poor decision making. I'm not sure. I've seen that before. I've also seen people, um, a lot of people actually in my comments, promoting spell casting services. Now I try to delete these as quickly as possible or I will block them from coming through entirely. They're usually claiming impossible feats and impossible acts. And actually one of my first videos I ever filmed was on this particular subject of figuring out how to identify these scammers. And so really briefly, there are a few things that I would immediately recognize as red flags setting off alarm bells. The first is if someone is claiming things that are physically impossible. So we're talking bringing people back from the dead. We're talking curing diseases that we don't even know how to cure with modern medicine, you know, promising certain things, saying 100% guaranteed, that's another one, 100% guarantee is one that gets me every single time. If we're talking things like past life readers, one really common one to look out for is if they are claiming that they have found the new life of Cleopatra or King Henry VIII or all of these figures, because how many times I have spoken to someone who claims that their past life was Cleopatra is actually amazing. All 100 of these people can't have been Cleopatra in a past life, which means someone, multiple someones, must have been told some misinformation. If we're talking kind of uh, big courses and, and shows and events and teaching spaces, we're looking at someone with very little personal history in the community. So if you were to ask someone about them, they would have no idea who they were. They've, they've never heard of them. And there's very little about them anywhere online. Um, someone who is perhaps claiming a lot without anything to back it up with, or if they are charging an extortionate amount of money for no reason. So I think it's different if flights and hotels are included and all that kind of stuff. But if we're talking about a course, just like a one day course being a thousand pounds, we're looking at alarm bells here because we intrinsically associate value with a high price tag but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. If we're talking authors who are trying to make money, for instance, selling AI books, these kind of things, you're looking at people where in the community, no one has ever heard of them. They've got no track record. No one knows who they are. No one knows what they practice. No one's ever seen them, met them. You know, these things are all like really big alarm bells, but generally speaking, common sense. Common sense prevails. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. I'm not sure if that's the term grifter that is being used specifically for this purpose, but that's kind of my experience in the community of if something does seem too good to be true, it probably is. And um, there are only two things that are 100% guaranteed. And that is that you are born and that is that you will die. And that is it. Everything else in between is not 100% anything. So if someone claims that what they are teaching you is 100% going to manifest, that sets off massive alarm bells for me every time. This next question very much leads on from the last one. What are some tools to help decipher misinformation and to stop it from spreading among the community? In my experience, misinformation is often spread through short form media. And so really this is what we're gonna be focusing on. It's not that it can't be spread in any other way, but this is mostly where we're seeing a lot of it coming from today. And the reason for this is because it has such a high turnover rate. 
you will forget a TikTok that you've seen two minutes after you've watched it, but 25 years later that book is still relevant. It's a very different process. The more content that is produced, the faster it is regurgitated, the more likely it is for misinformation to spread. So really we need to be focusing mostly on the short form content. We need to be looking at the whys and the where froms because this information is often what is missing. You can't fit that much into a short time frame, and so a lot of it gets skipped over. So if you're seeing something on an account and you've never heard of that before, it's worth checking where that information comes from. Go onto their account and see what their information is like. If their information is from their own personal experiences, this might be where it's come from. It is someone's own personal practice, their own trial and error, their own style. And so that needs to be taken into consideration because that is going to be very individual and it's going to vary from what we see produced in books that are maybe a little bit more um, general, a little bit more universal. So if we're looking at it from that perspective, it might not necessarily be misinformation. It might just not work for you because it's someone's personal practice. It might also be that when you Google the information that you see, it actually leads you to a book or a resource. And a little bit like the game of telephone, over time that information has been altered and adapted. And sometimes fear mongering plays a part in this. Information is taken out of context. It becomes almost scary in its own living thing. And then that lives on in social media. So the idea that all fae are evil or that we should curse the moon. I'm not really sure what happened to that, but that was something that happened in 2020 or 2021, something in that time frame. This kind of information spreads really, really quickly. And so it is something that we need to fact check and just make sure that it's correct. And you'll often find that it will all lead back to a singular source. And it's often slightly different than the way it is portrayed on social media. So short form content, critical eye, make sure that you are being observant, make sure that you cross reference. And that is really the biggest tip that I can give cross reference. Even if you're learning from a well respected elder in the community, that doesn't mean that they can't give you their own misinformation accidentally. We will pick up on the bad habits and the little misinformations that people have within their own personal belief systems. And if we are cross-referencing with other resources, it's a way of balancing it out. So don't just take your information from TikTok or YouTube. Don't just watch one person's content. Don't just read one book on the subject. Make sure that you're cross-referencing between them, especially between slower forms of content. If you're reading books, make sure that you are looking at the reviews. Make sure that you are checking the information on the person who wrote it to see if it aligns with your own personal practice. There's a lot going on here, but mostly it's a case of asking the whys and the where froms because sometimes there can be some crossover there and things can simply be accidentally misconstrued and then it can just spread like wildfire. I told you I can talk for England, right? I'm two hours 30 in. I have not even finished topic two yet. Oh no. <laughs> so this next question is a little bit longer, so I'm gonna read it off my screen. It says, how does a large following impact the perception of the creator? Does this immediately make them an expert or are there other assumptions as to why they may have a large following? For me, I don't think anyone is really an expert just because they have a following. They might have expertise if they are particularly knowledgeable in certain topics, but I don't necessarily think that following count directly correlates with expertise. I think it's important to take into consideration the kind of content that they create and also the time frame in which that content was created in. So a good example of this would be the witchcraft community on YouTube. When witchcraft started to become popular, there were very few witchcraft channels. And so the channels that were there were therefore very sought after because there wasn't that many of them. Now there's a lot more witchcraft channels. And so the channels that have been created since are perhaps not growing at the same rate as channels that came before them simply because there's saturation within that community. I think that's a really important part to play in all of this, as well as the content that is being made. If someone is primarily focusing on say the cinematography side of it, the very aesthetically pleasing, very beautiful side of it, their audience is going to be different than someone who focuses on the more academic side of it. It's the same community, but the people are watching for perhaps quite different reasons. And so how that person is perceived and why they have a following, even though they're part of the same community, might be different. Both of the content is valuable, it's just different aspects of the same whole community. And so I, I personally think that everyone that wants to share information about witchcraft 
has expertise of their own. Each person has their own kind of unique aspect of the practice that they are very knowledgeable in. I don't think that necessarily the popularity of someone shows that they are inherently better in the community than anyone else. I don't think that's the case. I, I have massive holes in my knowledge and I will say that even during live streams if someone asks me a question and I simply don't know the answer I'm not going to fumble my way through it because I am not an expert in everything I might have expertise in certain aspects of it but it doesn't go beyond that you know jack of all trades I am not particularly good at everything and I definitely think that there's a there's an aspect of luck in all of this as well it's about timing like when I started my channel in 2018 I did not start it with the intention of having however many subscribers I have now, like 189,000, I think at this point, which is what? Mind actually blown? That, 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 that number does not make sense inside my brain. I don't understand, I don't understand. Thank you everyone, by the way, if you have subscribed to me, watched my content, supported me in any way, just liking videos, things like that. Like it's, it's blown my mind completely. I suspect a massive proportion of this is down to pure luck. It is simply the fact that I was going through a really bad time in 2018 and I decided to use YouTube as an outlet, as a distraction, as something I could pour my energy into. And then lockdown hit and TikTok and witchcraft became really, really popular and now I'm here. Like, I think it, it plays a lot more on luck than it does any kind of prerequisite of expertness. I think it's much more about the luck of it and having a video that YouTube just decides it really likes rather than like an inherent expertise that you might have. I think it's definitely kind of a balance between the two. And lastly, for topic two, how does one balance authenticity and content creation? I'll be honest, I'm really struggling with this right now. I'm finding it really, really hard because the algorithm changes constantly. What would have been a really successful video a few months ago is now not a successful video at all. And I'm finding it really hard to, to juggle that, honestly, because when you are doing this as part of your job, it's important that you get the views, but I also don't want to be posting content that I would normally not be posting. It's really easy to get burned out, honestly. It's it's really easy to post content that you love only to have it not be shown to anyone. And it makes you feel kind of bad, just like in yourself, like it shouldn't matter what the numbers are, but the reality is, is that when this is part of your job and when people are asking like, oh, I didn't even know that you did your live stream this month, that it gets really disheartening. So it, it's a very fine line to walk and I can understand why people eventually do stop posting. And I think we've seen it a lot in the past few years of big creators, even outside of the witchcraft community, deciding I can't do this anymore. Because when you are fighting to figure out that place for your content, it becomes really, really exhausting. Like it's really tiring. So so be kind to your content creators, especially the ones that you really like, because it is, it's tricky. It's tricky trying to balance everything. So topic three is all about imposter syndrome and FOMO. So the first question is, when I follow other creators in community space, does it make me feel genuinely inspired and empowered or does it create feelings of FOMO and being less than? Many of you will likely already know, but I don't actually watch witchcraft on YouTube. And that's not because I don't like witchcraft on YouTube. It's not because I don't like the content creators. I love so many of them and I follow them on other platforms. It's just that it's too overwhelming. I have not followed or watched anyone really in about four years since the start of lockdown. And when I did watch the content, I was finding that almost inadvertently, I was aligning my own practice to how other people were doing things. And I was being almost accidentally inspired by them. And I always want my content to be as authentically mine as I can. And I don't wanna put myself or anyone else in that position of kind of accidentally replicating things. So I tend to support creators on other platforms instead. I follow them on social media, on Instagram, and I tend to avoid it on YouTube for that reason. So if you ask me my favorite content creators on YouTube, I can give you ones that are highly recommended to me. I can give you ones where the content creators I really like, but I tend to avoid watching it for my own sake. And I do want to avoid that kind of 
FOMO type feeling, I guess. I, I don't know if it's something I would necessarily feel, but it's not something I ever want to feel. I want to be like in my own lane, doing my own thing. Looking over at someone else is not going to benefit me. You know, it's that that thing of, of um, comparison is the thief of joy. To compare yourself to someone else whose story in life you know nothing about is not gonna make you feel any better. It's not gonna help you in any way. It's only gonna make it worse. So I tend to just stay in my lane and do my own thing. So next up we have, if I experience FOMO, has it ever left me feeling vulnerable to being taken advantage of financially or otherwise? An example would be the need to purchase the latest book or product to fit in. This is something I haven't experienced. And I think it's because I tend to avoid the quick turnover short form content that makes things go really viral and makes things seem really popular. Also, the fact that I don't watch witchcraft content on YouTube probably assists with this because I'm not really seeing what other practitioners are having and what other practitioners are using. I don't really notice it so much. So I don't feel that missing out aspect of it because I don't know what I'm missing out on. So I think possibly that is what plays a part in all of this. And all of the items in the books that I get typically come from like secondhand stores, antique stores, like they're like closures on libraries. And so all the books come in like from like the nineties and the two thousands. Like I'm very rarely am I going out and buying like a new release book. And so I often just don't even realize when something has come out. Like people will ask me to review a book and I'm like, I didn't even know that they'd published a second, let alone a third, you know, I'm that far behind. And I think it is the danger of particularly fast turnover content. You know, we see on TikTok a lot, the fact that there's a new viral product every like two and a half hours. It's because everything gets turned over so quickly and there's so much activity on it. Something can be made to be more desirable than perhaps it would be otherwise. And so if you are feeling similar to this, it could be worth kind of taking a step back from it temporarily just to see if you still feel that way when you aren't being constantly bombarded by people with things. Because that kind of total bombardment, I don't think helps. It can make us feel like we are behind everyone else when in reality, everyone is going at their own pace. No one has to align their speed with anyone else's. We're all like journeying on our own way. And having that additional book or that additional item is not gonna make your practice more successful. The most important thing with it is how you connect with your practice and how you work with the energy and what you connect with. That is what is more important than any item that you could possibly buy. I mean, I know that I post a lot of book videos and that's because the, the witchcraft and occult books are my real passion. That's where my passion lies. And I know that many of you feel the same way, but your practice is not gonna be lesser if you don't have that book that I mentioned it will be just as successful without it. If you would like to find it, then that is an option, but you are never going to be a lesser practitioner because you don't have it. Because it comes from in here rather than in the monetary items that we have. When practicing my craft, do I compare it to what I've seen other people do online? This is one where I will, I will sometimes look at things I see online and think, oh wow, that's so, beautiful. Like that's really, really gorgeous. And then I look at my own crafting space and it looks like I've thrown a bag of herbs in the air and just allowed it to fall where it falls and there's dripped wax just everywhere. <laughs> and then I remember that social media is staged. And I know I didn't mention it earlier, but I kind of figured it was already known in that a lot of my videos are scripted. They are scripted so that I can fit the most content into a short time frame. I know that my videos are still quite long, but trust me, they'd be longer if I was allowed to waffle like I am right now. As of right this second, I've been filming for three hours and I'm only halfway through this video. <laughs> but a lot of the stuff we see online is staged in the fact that it is scripted or the setup has been created specifically for it. You are taking things out of shot between frames so that it doesn't look too messy. Like it's always good for me to take a step back and be like, okay, well there, candle spell looks so beautiful. Like look at everything, it's so pristine and it's so perfect. And then I remember that in order to get it like that, to do all the cleanup between each shot that has been made, they've had to take like five to 10 minutes to do that. They are not using their energy seamlessly. 
they are breaking up their working in order to make it look aesthetically pleasing, which means either, as I mentioned earlier, it is a working that has been done specifically for the video and there's no energy involved, or perhaps that they're not using their energy as effectively as they could because they're spending a lot of it cleaning up between shots to make it look really nice. That's not to say that their workings are not powerful. It's just, it's important for us to think about the behind the scenes things. It's really easy to see in like an Instagram reel of someone doing a spell jar and going, oh wow, it's so beautiful. And then when you do it, there's herbs everywhere because you've missed the neck of the bottle and there's dripped wax everywhere and you've got incense burning in all funny directions and you're covered in wax. Like <laughs> these kind of things happen. And it's about recognizing that real practice is messy. Real practice is messy, the herbs get everywhere, sometimes it smells strange, like it is not always aesthetically pleasing and to not feel bad about it. Because really, if it works, that's what you're after. How pretty something looks is irrelevant to how good it works. And really, witchcraft is an outcome-based practice. You can do the most pretty, aesthetically pleasing working, but if it doesn't work, there is no point in doing it. You may as well do something that works and have it be messy and dirty, then have something that doesn't work and have it be aesthetically pleasing. What would my practice look like without the influence of social media and creators? So in terms of the creators, I don't think I can really apply that into my practice, but in terms of social media, my practice would be honestly not as diverse as it is. I don't think that I would have been able to buy as many books, to talk to as many people, to experience so many things in the community. I don't think that I would push myself to try different techniques so that I can share them with everyone if I didn't have to. I think that my core workings, like the core aspects of my practice would still be the same, but there's definitely things that I have pushed myself to do that I normally wouldn't do. So my Sabbath practices would probably not be as ornate as they are if I weren't doing research for videos on it, if I weren't trialing and erroring different workings to see which ones I liked, like if I weren't reaching out to try different techniques to see if I like it, I think my practice would be a lot less diverse than it is in terms of the different ways that I do things. I think that's really the big one for me is that I will often for videos push myself to do more than just candle magic because if it were just me in my everyday life that's probably what I would do but other people want to see different things and so I will actively try things that I normally wouldn't add into my practice. So it's definitely grown since I've been a creator um, and that's really lovely, especially because I don't necessarily have the influence of other people quite the same. I don't have so much of the negatives that might come from that. And then moving on to topic four, the capitalization of the community. The first question is actually one that I got on my previous live stream. And that is, do I think that online communities are equally as valid as in-person communities? This one is gonna depend on what you're after. No community is more valid or more useful than the other. It's just gonna depend on what it is that you want out of that community. If you want to be working group rituals and study in a group environment where you can practice and train with other practitioners, an in-person group is always going to be superior. But if you just wanna learn with other people, share your experiences, grow and develop with other people, an online community can be just as good and in some cases, better because often in-person groups are all focused on the same subjects, they might be interested in the same things, whereas online groups might be interested in differing topics and so you get a little bit more diversity there. I think that both are valid in their own way. It just depends on what you want. And if you want to be doing everything that an in-person group does, you're probably not gonna find that with an online group because you're not gonna be able to fulfill the same things. It doesn't fill the same niche. Both are useful but they're not the same. How have these online groups impacted me as a person and as a practitioner? I would not be, I, I honestly probably wouldn't still be a practitioner today if I hadn't have found online communities. I know that today a lot of people will look back on things like Spells of Magic and it's quite a lighthearted, jovial place. But for me, when I found that online space, 
it cemented so much in me that I didn't realize I needed cementing in me. I had spent so much of my time growing up feeling quite isolated, feeling quite unusual in my experiences, especially when I started talking to other people about it and they would look at me and have no idea what I was talking about because that's not something that they ever experienced. Finding online groups where you had practitioners that had been, well, practicing for decades, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that was incredible to me because although they didn't practice necessarily in the same way I did, the fact that they practice and they they had been doing it for so long showed me that there was something tangible in this. There was something real enough to get people to stick around for that long. And so being able to talk to these people, to learn from them, to be given book recommendations from them, to, to be able to share information back and forth with them was absolutely incredible and honestly life-changing because if that hadn't have happened I would not have started sharing content about witchcraft, I would not have started my business, I would not have made a YouTube channel, I would not be here today and I think that is amazing how something potentially as small and insignificant as a forum, just one forum on the entirety of the internet, could completely change someone's entire life so I will always have great respect for online communities and just communities of practitioners in general because it does change people's lives for the better, especially if they're feeling really isolated in their practice. And it definitely helped me to grow my practice because I would not have found really any of the resources that I started using, especially when I started buying books for the first time. I would not have found any of those books if it weren't for the recommendations of those people and my practice would look very, very different today. So what are the dangers of capitalizing off of witchcraft? Have I been affected or anyone that I've known? I've seen many, many people be taken advantage of because of this, but this didn't occur in the last, you know, one or two years. This is something that has been happening for decades. And it is, as I mentioned earlier, those people that pop up and say that you've been cursed and you need to give me $10,000 and I can undo it for you. These kind of scams have been around for a very, very long time. And I think social media has definitely made it worse, but it hasn't created it. You also have people selling stones, crystals that are fake instead of real for exorbitant prices, people using unethical methods of mining in order to do that as well. You have people selling goods and materials that aren't even real, that they've not even made, that they are buying off AliExpress or Timu or any of these other places and passing it off as being an authentic thing that they've made themselves. And this kind of stuff has always happened, it's just social media has definitely made it worse. I think the biggest danger is people not knowing where value is anymore. People want all the information straight away and so they will buy a course on witchcraft and the problem is, is that what they're expecting at the end of it is not what's ever going to happen. They're expecting to do this course and be a master magical practitioner and never have to do any research ever again and they can just manifest whatever they want and they can cast any spell that they want and it will always happen. And the reality is, is that that's not how it works. You cannot be spoon fed information and expect to have a full understanding of it. You need to know the ins and outs, the whys, the whens, the hows, the what fors. These are all really important. And a lot of these courses have a tendency to proclaim that they will teach you everything you need to know. It's bullshit. It's absolute bollocks. It's not gonna happen because you need to have that understanding. You need to go through the trial and error. You need to be putting in the work, the figuring out the whys. Like these are all things that you need to do. Like these things might seem really boring, but it is the fundamentals of how you learn something in and out, back to front. It's really important. And also the desire for material goods, especially the desire for material goods that are cheap and ultimately are not going to help your magical practice. You can have every object under the sun and unless you're putting in the work, it is not gonna benefit you especially if those goods are made by people who are not being paid, not being paid enough, not being paid at all, in horrendous work and living conditions. If what you're using is negatively impacting both people and the environment, then that is definitely not gonna benefit your practice. So really, 
the biggest problem I think in all of this is a loss in value. Things that held value were knowledge, were time, were understanding, were practice. And now things that hold value are courses that claim to teach you everything and goods that will make you powerful when the power comes from in here. It is just that people aren't necessarily willing to put the time in to unlock that. Some people are not gonna like my answers to the next two questions, but just hear me out before you make comment. The first is, should there be paywalled communities and courses? Courses especially, yes, 100%, because people don't realize the amount of time and effort it takes to do everything. And if it's an in-person course, you're looking at financial loss as well. If you have to rent a building, that's expensive. If you have to buy insurance to have a course there, that's expensive. If you want a coven meeting in an environment, that's expensive. If you want goods to use to do the workshop, to do the community course, that's expensive. It takes days, weeks to script a YouTube video. Just imagine how much time it's going to take to script and plan an entire course that might last for weeks, even months. To do the homework, to do the coursework, to get all of the lesson plans booked out, to have people come in to do the courses. That's time and that's money. And that's not free. <laughs> like no one can give up that much time. And this applies to the next question as well, which is how does one ensure the authenticity of courses and workshops when there's financial investment? I think we have a weird understanding within this community. It's really the only community that has it, that it's a gift and it should be given for free. But witchcraft is a craft. It's a hard worked skill. It is something you've developed and nurtured over time. And that isn't something that you would ask anyone else to give for free. Can you imagine expecting a guitar teacher to teach you for four hours for free because they have a gift and they should share it freely with the world? No, because it takes them time and money to drive to that place. They are taking time off what they are doing to be able to do what they're doing for several hours, one-on-one -on -one interactions where they might be needing insurance and other additional items. That would not be expected to be done for free. I don't understand why the witchcraft community feels that the way that it does about gifts. It's a gift, it should be shared freely, except that time isn't free. You would still need to be paid for the time that you are spending doing that. So while I understand the frustration of people that they can't access something because there's a paywall or they aren't able to go on that course because it's too expensive for them. I think it's important to remember that these are not the only ways to learn things. You can study and practice with free content. YouTube is full of it. There are thousands of hours of witchcraft content out there where you don't have to do anything but watch an advert. That advert pays the content creators. And so by doing that, they are still getting paid for their time, but it's not coming out of your pocket. It is simply the time of you watching an advert that pays that content creator. When it comes to assessing the authenticity of events like this, whether they are groups or courses, I think it's important to take into consideration the entirety of it. Is it online? Is it in person? Is it gonna last multiple weeks or months? Is it something that is going to need additional investment by the person who is creating it? Is there coursework or homework that needs to be filled in and marked? How many people are going to be involved? All of these are gonna show you whether the financial investment is going towards them or whether it's going towards the course themselves. While I think it's important for creators to be paid appropriately for the work that they are putting in, it's important that they are not being greedy and overcompensated in a way that is gonna come across as kind of scammy and not really that great. It's also important to look into who is running the course, who is running the group. Is it someone with experience in the subject? Are they well known in it? Are people looking at it fondly? Have people had good experiences in the past? This is all really important because if it's the first time a course has been run and it's really expensive and no one has ever heard of the person who's running it, that's a massive red flag. Whereas if a course has been going for several years and there's lots of people out there who know the person, perhaps they're an author, perhaps they're known in the community, and then there's also people with really positive experiences, I think that really shows that there's definitely something deeper in here than someone simply trying to make money. I get that it's really frustrating when things often have quite a high price tag on them, but usually it's because of all of the stuff in the background that goes into it. Because planning it, scripting it, running it, doing all of the homework for people, marking all the coursework, paying for the insurance, paying for the building, it's not cheap. 
And so that all needs to be taken into consideration. There's a lot behind the scenes that often doesn't get looked into quite the same when you are a customer than if you were, say, putting it on. And then lastly, let's wrap things up with some conclusions. Now, there's a lot of questions in the conclusion section and a lot of them can be answered in kind of the same way. A lot of them surround the idea of what does the community need more of or how can we improve on things? And the answer is usually open, honest communication. So some of the questions include, what are some topics of conversation I'd like to see more in the community? Mostly, I would like to see us talk about things that are maybe a little bit more uncomfortable to talk about. I would like us to be able to open up more about things that are perceived as being baneful or negative as a way of opening up communication, having more understanding of a topic. Even if we don't practice it ourselves, it's really useful to understand negative magic. It's really useful to know how love magic is used around the world by different people. I think it's really important to understand context as being significant and how nuance is really important. The community as a whole is really, really good but there are definitely certain areas of the community that are very quick to judge and are very quick to throw blame and are very quick to shut down any conversation that they don't feel comfortable with in regards to negative magic, love spells, blood magic, sex magic, these kind of things. And I think for safety's sake, more than anything else, these conversations need to be had. If no one is talking about how to do something safely, how does anyone know how to do it safely? If no one knows how to get out of a tricky situation, how does anyone improve on that? If no one is willing to talk about working with demons, how does anyone know how to get out of it if they get themselves into something that they don't understand? Even if you don't want to practice it, this conversation is really important. What are some of my community needs? Communication. Usually in the listen first, process, then talk approach. I often find I over explain things. I always have, I always will probably, because a lot of people will jump straight to conclusions. And I think the, the biggest thing that people collectively need to learn is we cannot judge at face value. You need to have that additional information. And so listen, process it, and then kind of start talking and adding your own opinion in there. I think that's really useful. Where would I most like to be held and supported by the community? I actually don't really know, other than everyone just collectively agreeing that we are all learning. Every single person is learning. Even if they are a big content creator or a small content creator or an elder in the community or a newbie in the community, I think everyone deserves to have the grace of acknowledging that everyone is on a journey. Everyone is learning, everyone is growing. And I think giving people grace is really important, especially when we're talking about topics, as mentioned, that aren't typically discussed. I think having that additional grace is really useful because people people will make mistakes and people will do silly things and people will do things that maybe you don't agree with, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be judged harshly for something. I think everyone needs that grace, that leeway to make mistakes, to trial and error, to figure out what works for them and what doesn't, to fuck up. Honestly, everyone is going to have a fuck up at some point, whether it is spilling candle wax all over the floor or whether it is doing something silly and insulting a spirit. I think there is always that grace to change and adapt and grow as people. And I think that's largely been lost. It's a you should know the answer to this, or you should know better. How is anyone meant to know better if they've never learned yet, or if it's new to them? Like, you are not going to instantly have all of the answers is basically what I'm trying to say. Where do I feel like I'm not truly being seen by the community? I think ultimately it comes back to that same thing of nobody knows everything and give people the grace to have their expertise and to have areas where they aren't particularly expert at. I have received some of the most obscure messages ever from people because I do something in a slightly different way to how they do it. They will just like cuss out everything that I do. And it's really weird. It's like this strange dynamic where content creators are no longer seen as people. I always find it really odd. It's almost as though I am perceived as being a thing. I am a thing on the internet that gives information that you demand. 
and people are very demanding sometimes. They, they will be very, very brisk in how they word things as though they were talking to a computer or an AI device or something. I think a lot of the time there is this disconnect between the person I'm watching on my screen is actually reading the comments and is actually a person that actually exists. And people often forget that. So sometimes I'd like to be seen as a person, like a, just a normal person, you know, just, just an everyday Joe who just happens to have ended up on YouTube <laughs> because sometimes people will say things and I genuinely think they forget that I am not just a computer and it is, it's a really weird experience. How can we help each other in removing external peer pressure and grow in the community? I think it, it everything kind of comes back to communication and it giving people grace. You know, that the whole peer pressure comes from the idea that you are less than, you are not as good as, some, someone is superior to you. And I, I think it comes back to the fact that we need to acknowledge that we are all people, we all make mistakes, we all follow a different path at a different time, and we are all going in slightly different directions. And being able to communicate well I think is really, really useful. How can we as a community come together more with constructive criticism without it seeming shady or passive aggressive? Maybe this comes from my idea of like over explaining myself, but I think as mentioned, communication is really important. I think communication and acknowledging that people are real is another thing. People are way harsher with their words when they are behind a computer screen than they would be in person. And often the communication is lost somewhat because text does not show context. Text doesn't show tone in the same way that it does me talking to you. So I think that that's something that people need to consider a lot more than they do in that the words that you say might, might come across very differently without the tone of your voice. And it's much better to over explain yourself than to under explain yourself. Because although people often don't like over explaining because it sounds like an excuse or it sounds like you're being too much, for me anyway, I would rather have too much context than not enough. And it needs to be said in a way that isn't overly harsh, it's not harassing. You can have constructive criticism, but if that constructive criticism is worded with swearing, with abuse, with language that makes it very, very aggressive, that's no longer constructive criticism. You are hiding your actual intention behind the claim of constructive criticism. Otherwise, all of that additional stuff that you added in is unnecessary. I think it's really important that we perceive people as people, not as objects that we can use and abuse. And then lastly, we have who are some of my favorite content creators in the sphere and this one is really difficult for me because I don't really watch YouTube for its witchcraft content. But what I can do is list a whole bunch of people that I think are really valuable in the community. And they, they're all gonna play their own different parts in it. And this is also going to include people that have tagged me in things and who have been making their own videos on their channel, even if it maybe isn't as large as other content creators. So I'm gonna do that in the description box and probably also the top comment. Um, and if you want to add your own content creators that you really enjoy, feel free to do that too, because then we can slowly add to it as time goes on. I think that'd be really nice to like add additional content creators in there. So they will all be linked down in somewhere, whether it's the description box or the comment section. So yeah, feel free to go and check those out. And if you would like to do this yourself, feel free to do so and tag me in it and I will give it a watch. I did warn you this was gonna be a long one. I have been filming for three hours and 43 minutes. <laughs> it's nearly dark now. So if you've managed to stick to the end of this very, very long video, feel free to put some books, book emojis in the comment section and I will try to, uh, I will try to like as many of them as I can. Wow, my words are leaving me now. And I have no idea how I'm going to split this video. So we'll have to see if I have to put it into two parts. They will be out back to back. Uh, otherwise, I have no idea how I'm gonna get this down to the size it needs to be because it's like nearly four hours long. 
So anyway, I hope that you did enjoy this. Let me know your opinions on any of these topics down in the comment section. Just tell me which question that you are answering so that we can figure out where we are together. Otherwise, it's going to get really, really confusing. If you did like this video, feel free to give it a like. It really means a lot to me. If you've got any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, feel free to put them down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you're staying safe. I hope you have a marvelous, magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!